Hello friends. So today's video is going to be a list of some anticipated releases for fantasy for the month of May. My dog happens to be laying right next to me and she will inevitably get up and either move around or she will start making some silly noises. So just a heads up if and when that does occur. But regardless, jumping into the anticipated releases, as always, I'm going to go in order of projected release date in the description bar. I will have all this information if you'd like to reference back to it. I'm going to start with May 2nd. There's actually quite a few books listed for the second. And then as far as I could tell, for the ones that I'm interested in at least, none listed for the 9th. And then there's a couple that maybe aren't for sure coming out on a usual Tuesday. That happens from time to time. Usually they come out on Tuesdays. Sometimes they don't. But Anyway, starting with May 2nd, the first one would be Dragonfall. This has somewhat mixed reviews way back when I first made this anticipated releases list for myself. This one looked very promising. It seemed very exciting and interesting, but it would seem that quite a few people thus far haven't loved it. That doesn't always mean that it's not going to be a hit or that it's not going to be good. It could just mean that it's not going to be as mass appeal and that maybe there will be more of a niche audience for it. Still sounds interesting. I'm still interested in picking it up. The synopsis for this one says, long banished dragons revered as gods return to the mortal realm in the first in this magical new epic fantasy trilogy from a best-selling author. Long ago, humans betrayed dragons, stealing their magic and banishing them to a dying world. Centuries later, their descendants worship dragons as gods, but the gods remember and they do not forgive. Thief Arcady scrapes a living on the streets of Vetra. Desperate, Arcady steals a powerful artifact from the bones of the plague bringer, the most hated person in Lumet history. Only Arcady knows the artifact's magic holds the key to a new life among the nobles at court and a chance for revenge. The spell connects to Everin, the last male dragon, foretold to save his kind, dragging him through the veil. Disguised as a human, Everin soon learns that to regain his true power and form and fulfill his destiny, he only needs to convince one little thief to trust him enough to bond completely, body, mind, and soul, and then kill them. Yet the closer the two become, the greater the risk both their worlds will shatter. What I think is kind of interesting is that same day, Currently, there is a projected release date for the next book that I'm going to mention, which is called Fourth Wing, which also seems to have dragons within the story, which, yay, I always love when we get some dragons. We've had so many fae lately that I'm ready for some of the classic fantasy mythological creatures. But regardless, like I was saying, Dragonfall seems to have mixed early reviews, whereas this one has some of the most five stars that I've ever seen for a book that's not yet out and isn't something by... Sarah J Mass or Sanderson or something like that where people will just rate it five stars before it's out anyway because they love the author. It's a book that I've seen even some people who have gotten arcs on Instagram have been speaking very very highly of this one. So, fingers crossed. The synopsis for this one again called Fourth Wing says 20-year-old Violet Sorengale was supposed to enter the Scribe Quadrant, living a quiet life among books and history. Now, the commanding general, also known as her tough as Talon's mother, has ordered Violet to join the hundreds of candidates striving to become the elite of Navarre, dragon riders. But when you're smaller than everyone else and your body is brittle, death is only a heartbeat away because dragons don't bond to fragile humans. They incinerate them. With fewer dragons willing to bond than cadets, most would kill Violet to better their own chances of success. The rest would kill her just for being her mother's daughter. Like Zayden Ryerson, the most powerful and ruthless wing leader in the writer's quadrant. She'll need every edge her wits can give her just to see the next sunrise. Yet, with every day that passes, the war outside grows more deadly, the kingdom's protective wards are failing, and the death toll continues to rise. Even worse, Violet begins to suspect leadership is hiding a terrible secret. Friends, enemies, lovers, everyone at Bay's Gioth War College has an agenda, because once you enter, there are only two ways out, graduate or die. So it's very interesting to me that this one, Luna's, sorry, Luna's spinning in circles doing that dog thing where she paws at the carpet and then has to go in circles and pause. Anyway, this one, it's interesting to me that it has so, so many high ratings already because a lot of that seems a little generic. I mean, we've seen Dragon Riders before. We've seen the Elite School before. We've seen that person who's the underdog who likely won't really get a chance. We've seen a lot of that before, but... 
early reviews, I've tried not to look at specifics as to what people are saying because it's important to me that when I review books and I talk about them in my new release wrap ups that I, as much as possible, my thoughts are my own. I'm not influenced by what other people have been saying. But inevitably, when I look up the synopsis and I'm doing this research for these upcoming releases, I'll see the amount of ratings and then the amount of, you know, five star, four star, because it's broken down on Goodreads. And this one, it's it's just five stars. It's That's all it is, basically. And so I'm really surprised by that amount of five stars compared to that synopsis. Doesn't seem like anything particularly new, but sometimes you don't need anything particularly new. Sometimes you just need something done well. At least it's not Faye, right? <laughs> and on that note, let's talk about a Faye story called The Thorns Remain. I do think this one sounds good. And I'm not opposed to always, I'm not opposed to picking up new stories that have Faye, but it's just, you know, been there, done that a lot. This next one is called The Thorns Remain. A dance with the Fae will change everything. 1919, in a highland village forgotten by the world, harvest season is over, and the young who remain after war and flu have ravaged the village will soon head south to make something of themselves. Maura Jean and her friends head to the forest for a last night of laughter before parting ways. Maura Jean is left behind. She had plans to leave once, but her lover died in France and with him her future. The friends light a fire, sing a dance, but with every twirl about the flames, strange new dancers thread between them, music streaming from the trees. The Fae are here. Suddenly, Maura Jane finds herself all alone, her friends spirited away. The iron metal of her lost love, pinned to her dress, protected her from magic. For the Fae feel forgotten too. Led by the darkly handsome Lord of the Fae, they are out to make themselves known once more. Maura Jean must enter into a bargain with the Lord to save her friends, and fast, for the longer one spends with the Fae, the less like themselves they are upon return. If Maura Jean cannot save her friends before Beltine, they will be lost forever. Completely bewitching, threaded with highland charm, and sparkling with dark romance, this is a fairy tale that will carry you away. That one maybe also doesn't sound as original, but alas, still something I'm interested in. After that, still from what I can tell, May 2nd, we have Sword Defiant. This is an Orbit release, I believe, and I have really enjoyed a lot of what Orbit has been putting out the last few years, so I'm excited just from that alone. But the synopsis for the Sword Defiant says, set in a world of dark myth and dangerous prophecy, this thrilling fantasy launches an epic tale of daring warriors, living weapons, and bloodthirsty vengeance. Many years ago, Sir Aelfric and his nine companions saved the world, seizing the Dark Lord's cursed weapons, along with his dread city of Necrad. That was the easy part. Now, when Aelfric, keeper of the cursed sword Spellbreaker, learns of a new and terrifying threat, he seeks the nine heroes once again, but they are wandering adventurers no longer. Yesterday's eager heroes are today's weary leaders, and some have turned to the darkness, becoming monsters themselves. If there's one thing Ilfric knows, it's slaying monsters, even if they used to be his friends. And that's it for the synopsis. It looks like the synopsis is longer, but it's just quotes from other publications and individuals. But at first, it sounds like uh, Warrior, or Kings of the Wild, excuse me. It sounds like Kings of the Wild at first in its synopsis, but then it sounds like it gets really serious because he's trying to recruit these people who are past their prime and they're old and weary. And then some of them are monsters now and he has to go kill them. It took a dark turn in the synopsis, but sounds good. The next one says the salt grows heavy. This is a razor sharp and bewitching fairy tale of discovering the darkness in the world and the darkness within oneself. You may think you know the fairy how the fairy tale goes. A mermaid comes to the shore and weds the prince. But what the fables forget is that the mermaids have teeth and now her daughters have devoured the kingdom and burned it to ashes. On the run, the mermaid is joined by a mysterious plague doctor with a darkness of their own. Deep in the eerie, snow-crusted forest, the pair stumble upon a village of ageless children who thirst for blood, and the three saints who control them. The mermaid and her doctor must embrace the cruelest parts of their true nature if they hope to survive. Haven't seen too many people rating that one. I just think it sounds really interesting. After that, we can skip over the week of the 9th, as it wouldn't seem there's anything being released that week, but... With the 16th, we have the release of Painted Devils. The first book is called Little Thieves. So I wasn't expecting there to be a sequel to this one. It read like a standalone, and for a while it was, from what I could tell, a standalone. And then we've heard about this sequel 
for quite a while now, so I am really excited about this one. It's hard to say too much about it because you don't want to spoil things from the first book, but it is a retelling of a fairy tale, the Goose Girl tale specifically, and it actually follows the villainous character from that story, but then it's sort of humanizing her and showing her her motivations behind why she's doing what she's doing. And there's also a lot of commentary on status and such things within that story. So it was, I thought, really, really enjoyable. Also, the author has some of her illustrations, her sketches in the story that just contributed to that feeling of I'm picking up a storybook, a fairy tale, and I'm reading through this old story where you have these somewhat eerie, grim looking sketches throughout that detail what's going on throughout the book. So I really liked that that was incorporated. I always appreciate illustrations for one, but also when some of the author's other talents can be showcased within their works. I just think that's incredible. So I really, really liked Little Thieves. I am excited for Painted Devils. It would seem there's going to be a cult that emerges as a result of things that occurred in the first book. And that's all I really feel like I can say without spoiling events from the first one. After that, we have the Enchanted Hacienda. It says that the Enchanted Hacienda introduces us to the magical Estrada family. The warmth and humor of the Enchanted Hacienda immediately casts a spell over me, says Katie Hayes, New York Times bestselling author of The Cloisters. When Harlow Estrada is abruptly fired from her dream job and her boyfriend proves to be a jerk, her world turns upside down. She flees New York City to the one place she can always call home, the enchanted Hacienda Estrada. The Estrada family farm in Mexico houses an abundance of charmed flowers cultivated by Harlow's mother's sis mother, sorry, she only has one, sisters, aunts, and cousins. By harnessing the magic in these flowers, they can heal hearts, erase memories, interpret dreams, but not Harlow. So when her mother and aunt give her a special task involving the family's magic, she panics. How can she rise to the occasion when she is magicless? But maybe it's not magic she's missing, but belief in herself. When she finally embraces her unique gifts and opens her heart to a handsome stranger, she discovers she's far more powerful than she imagined. With unforeseen twists, romance, and a heavy sprinkle of magic, The Enchanted Hacienda is a captivating coming-of-age debut exploring identity, unconven not unconventional, unconditional family love, and uncovering the magic within us all. I like to blame the fact that I'm sick on my struggles reading aloud today, but it's not that. I just can't read. After that, we have this sequel to The Final Strife, and the sequel is called The Battle Drum, just like with Little Thieves. I can't say too much about the sequel's synopsis, as that would probably give away events from what happens in the first one. So I'll tell you a little bit about The Final Strife. This is one that follows a society that is a mix of African and Arabian setting, and it follows a group that is broken up into three sections. It's a caste system. The bottom is horrifically, horrifically treated. Then you have the middle class who has some freedoms. They're treated certainly better than the class at the bottom. And then you have the elite. And the very bottom class, when they are young, they have their tongues taken out and their hands cut off. And they are given special kinds of equipment that allow them to do the types of labor that they are tasked with, but they cannot talk and therefore cannot communicate. And then the middle class after that, they are involved, of course, with other forms of work and such things, but they are not granted the luxuries that the top class has. And there are individuals within this middle group that decide that they are going to do what they can to essentially start an uprising, to try and gain more freedoms and privileges for all of society. So it is a caste system revolution type of story. I know that we've seen quite a few of those before, but I still think that this one had a uniqueness to it. I will say the first one, I was kind of middle of the road for it simply because it felt like the characters who are young, they did act young, but that was strangely juxtaposed to the tone and some of the violence that would occur throughout the rest of the story. So it seemed kind of like an odd mix, an odd balance. And when I say the characters acted young, I mean, there would be this sense of lightness and silliness and almost like a jovial joking way of talking to one another and not sort of, oh, life sucks, so let's make the most of it by just laughing off the pain. It wasn't quite like that. It just, it almost seemed like they had a personality that I wouldn't expect for a society that's constantly beating you down and showing you horrifically violent things all the time. But a couple of my friends have read the arc of it and they have said that they think that that tone is balanced better in the sequel. So I am still planning on picking up the second one and I'm hoping that the series continues to get better and better as it goes, still definitely would recommend giving it a try. 
After that, we have The Endless War. From what I understand, only the audiobook will be available in the month of May, not the actual physical book. The physical book will come out later. This is the fourth book, you could say, in the Bridge Kingdom series, but the second in the uh, second story in the Bridge Kingdom series, if that makes sense. But it's the fourth installment overall, and it's following two characters that you're introduced to in the previous book, The Inadequate Heir. This series is very much political fantasy mixed with fantasy romance. It doesn't really have any magic. It is purely focused on it being a different world with its own political system. That's what makes it more fantasy, but it's not magic, so it's very easy to get into. And the romance is a little bit on the spicier side. I typically like really wholesome, cute, adorable types of romances when I do pick up fantasy romance, but this one is an exception. Sorry, there's a plane, if you can hear it. I'm just gonna keep talking though. Um, I do tend to like the cuter, but this one, I like the political aspects and I like the characters. So I am curious with the second one. I'm not sure if I'll listen to it in May or if I'll wait till the physical book is released. If I'm remembering correctly, there is a deal that this author has with Audible where they require her to have her audiobook on Audible for a certain amount of time before she can release the physical copy. So that would be why the, uh, the physical copy won't be out just yet. After that, we have Perilous Times. So this one, it's a, it sounds really funny. It's a really long synopsis. I'm just gonna read the very beginning. So it is a take on the Knights of the Round Table, but one that I, because we've seen that so many times, right? We've seen the King Arthur types of tales. We've seen it again and again and again. This is one though where I'm like, all right, seems like they're doing something very different with it. And it seems like it's gonna be pretty funny and maybe a little cheeky. It says, an immortal knight of the round table faces his greatest challenge yet, saving the politically polarized, rapidly warming world from itself in this slyly funny contemporary take on Arthurian legend. Legends don't always live up to reality. Being reborn as an immortal defender of the realm gets awfully tiring over the years, or at least that's what Sir Kay's thinking as he claws his way up from beneath the earth yet again. Kay once rode alongside his brother, King Arthur, as a knight of the round table. Since then, he has fought at Hastings and at Waterloo and in both world wars, but now he finds himself in a strange new world where oceans have risen, the army's been privatized, and half of Britain's been sold to foreign powers. The dragon that's running amok, that he can handle. The rest, he's not so sure. And then it mentions some other characters as well, but I just feel like that's all you need to hear, that basically it's taking characters from the Arthurian legend and it's throwing them into modern times and they're expected to be these great heroes but with our modern political systems. I think that sounds really funny. I'll be very curious to see what we get with that. After that, we have The Blighted Stars, and I've not yet read anything by this author. I have heard good things, if it's the one I'm thinking of. And it says, when a spy is stranded on a dead planet with her mortal enemy, she must first figure out how to survive before she can uncover the conspiracy that landed them both here in the first place. She's a revolutionary. Humanity is running out of options. Habitable planets are being destroyed as quickly as they're found, and Naira Sharp knows the reason why. The all-powerful Mercator family has been controlling the exploration of the universe for decades and exploiting any materials they find along the way under the guise of helping humanity's expansion. But Naira knows the truth and she plans to bring the whole family down from the inside. He's the heir to the dynasty. Tarquin Mercator never wanted to run a galaxy-spanning business empire. He just wanted to study rocks and read books. But Tarquin's father has tasked him with monitoring the mining of a new planet, and he doesn't really have a choice in the matter. Disguised as Tarquin's new bodyguard, Naira plans to destroy his ship before it lands, but neither of them expects to end up stranded on a dead planet. To survive and keep her secret, Naira will have to join forces with the man she's sworn to hate, and together they will uncover a plot that's bigger than the both of them. Last on the list, we have Martha Wells' book, Witch King. I'm very excited for this one. I've not yet read anything by Martha Wells. I plan to very soon. But this one says, a story of power and friendship, of trust and betrayal, and of the families we choose. I didn't know you were a demon. You idiot, I'm the demon. Kai's having a long day in Martha Wells' Witch King. After being murdered, his consciousness dormant and unaware of the passing of time while confined in an elaborate water trap, Kai wakes to find a lesser mage attempting to harness Kai's magic to his own advantage. That was never going to go well. But why was Kai imprisoned in the first place? What has changed in the world since his assassination? And why does the Rising World Coalition appear to be growing in influence? Kai will need to pull his allies close and draw on all his pain magic 
if he is to answer even the least of these questions. He's not going to like the answers. Definitely has my interest peaked, but that would be it for some anticipated releases for the month of May. Like I said at the beginning, I will have information for all of these in the description bar down below for you to reference back to. Let me know if you're anticipating any of these or if there's any other anticipated fantasy and sci-fi releases that I didn't talk about here. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you later. Bye.